In the previous lecture, I introduced the concept of momentum and indicated how this conservation principle can make it easier to handle certain mechanics problems. We are going to get, take one more step in the direction of using conservation principles and work with energy conservation in this lecture. You have been hearing about work and energy maybe since your 10th, 11th grade. I am going to show you in this lecture how these concepts arise naturally when I try to eliminate the time from the equation of motion. Recall that the equation of motion is F is equal to m dv over dt, but at times it may so happen that I am not interested in the evolution of the system as a function of time. For example, if a particle is falling in the gravitational field of the earth, I may be interested in knowing what is this velocity at a certain height from the earth and I do not have to really worry about time. In such, such situations, we eliminate time. How do we do that? If I write f equals m dv dt, this is equal to I can write as m dv dx dx dt. I am taking only one dimension into account right now. For three dimensional cases, we will see later what happens. So, f let us take now only x direction is equal to m d v x d t which I wrote as m d v x d x d x d t which is m v x d v x over d x which is m over 2 d over d x v x square. So, you see I have now related the force directly to velocity and there is no need to integrate over time. Let us see how it makes our problem solving slightly easier. Let me go back to the example of gravitational field since I mentioned that earlier. Suppose I want to know the velocity of a particle in gravitational field. If the particle is moving in the radial direction, then I have d r dt is equal to the force which is in radial direction itself which is minus g m m over r square or it should be d 2 r by d t square because I am talking about the acceleration and the mass. And therefore, I have d 2 r over d t square as equal to minus g m over r square. This equation is very difficult to integrate with respect to time. On the other hand, let me apply the trick I used earlier in writing d 2 r d t square as d over d r d r d t times d r d t and that gives me v r d over d r v r and therefore, half d over d r v r square is equal to minus g m over r square. This is an equation which can be easily integrated with respect to r to obtain velocity as a function of the radial distance from the center or the height from the center of the earth from the surface of the earth. So, the need to eliminate t gives me a slightly different equation. Let me look at it slightly more carefully. So, I had written earlier f x equals m d 
V x over d t and by transforming this into the form d over d x V x d x over d t I got that f x is equal to one half m d over d x V x square. If I integrate this equation, what I get is half m v x at some position x 2 square minus 1 half m v at some position v x 1 square is equal to integration f x d x from position x 1 to x 2. Let us now interpret this equation. I am going to call this f x d x the work done by the force. I am going to call this quantity 1 half m v square the kinetic energy of the particle. So, what it tells me is that the change in kinetic energy is equal to the work done by a force. Not only have I defined the work and kinetic energy for you, I have also obtained a relationship between the two in that the change in the kinetic energy of a particle is going to be equal to the work done by a force on it. Although I have taken a one dimensional example, I will now generalize to three dimensional example. This is a statement in one dimension of the work energy theorem, which we use in solving mechanics problems again and again. Let us see now if I can generalize to three dimensions. So, work done I had written as f x d x in one dimension in three dimensions the work done is going to be the force taken a dot product with d l integrated from point 1 to point 2. Let me explain this. Suppose a particle is moving from one position to some other position from 1 to 2. I can break this path into small small segments of d l each and for each segment I calculate the work done which is equal to the force in the direction of that segment times the length of that segment and integrate. So, that gives me the work done by this force. Notice that I have to then know as to which path I am going over. So, this is the work done. Let us see if this can be related to the change in the energy or kinetic energy of the system. So, work which is equal to f dot d l can be written as m d v d t times d l and when the particle is moving along a curve like this d l is going to be v d t and therefore, I have work is equal to integration m v dot d v and this is nothing but integration m d v square over 2. When integrated over it gives me work is equal to half m v final square minus 1 half m v initial square and the work as defined is f dot d l moving over a curve from point over curve c from point 1 to point 2 is equal to delta k e. So, we have in general that the work done by a force is equal to change in the 
kinetic energy and I am going to call this the work energy theorem. I emphasize again when I calculate the work done it is the work done by the force. Let me now ask a question since I talked about a particle moving along a curve from one point to some other point. Is the work independent of the path or does it depend on which path am I taking? So, if I calculate F dot d L from point 1 to point 2. Is it the same whether I take this path or some other path or third path or is it different? In general the answer is that could be different. The most simple example for this is the frictional force. Let us again take a one dimensional example. Suppose I take a particle from point 1 to point 2, 1 directly and 1 take it to some other point and bring it back here. You can see that the work done by the frictional force in this case is going to be much larger than the work done by the frictional force in this case. So, in general the work done by any force depends on the path taken. Let us take another example for of this. Suppose there is a force field where the force applied is in circular direction. That is if a particle is here it will experience a force now that you know planar polar coordinates in phi direction. Let me then take a particle from point A to point B through two different paths. Path 1 let it be this one A to B directly and path 2 let it be like this A to C and C to B like this let this point be C. In the first case when I calculate F A B it is in the direction of phi something but the displacement D L is in direction d L r. So, f dot d L is 0 and therefore, work done a to b is equal to 0. How about work when I go from a to c to b? This is going to be work from a to c plus work from c to b. Work from a to c is like work from a to b therefore, 0 but this is not because here the displacement and the force both are in phi direction. In fact, if f depends only on the radial distance then work A C B is going to be the force at radius r times pi over 2 r which is non-zero. So, if the particle moves in this force field from A to B through this path my work energy theorem is going to have a kinetic energy at this point. On the other hand if it moves along this point there is going to be no change in the kinetic energy. So, in, this is another example of the force uh, the force field where the work depends on the path taken. Let us see what happens if the work done is path independent. So, we have seen two examples of cases where the work depends on the path taken, but there are many many forces in nature for which the work done is path independent. That is no matter which path I take whether I go from 1 to 2 along this path or this path or this path the work done from 1 to 2 is going to be independent 
of path. An example of this is the gravitational field, the work done when two charges move due to their Coulomb interaction. In this case, if I go from 1 to 2 and come back via other path from 2 to 1, work done since the magnitudes are equal is going to be positive in one direction, negative in the, one, the other direction and therefore, in a closed path work done is 0. So, we have seen two cases, in one case the work may depend on path, in the other case work may not depend on path. For the cases where work is path dependent are known as non-conservative forces. Whereas, when work is path independent these forces are known as conservative forces. So, we just saw that frictional force is non-conservative. The force field like this is non-conservative. Gravitational force is conservative. These are important concepts. The certain things I can do for conservative forces is which I cannot do for non-conservative forces and that is precisely why I define these two classes. You will see later in your course in electromagnetism that this kind of E field or force field arises when magnetic field changes with respect to time.